This week, a tool that finds vulnerable robots on the internet. A new exploit that threatens over 9,000 Cisco routers. Apple turns off group FaceTime after an eavesdropping bug. WordPress sites under attack again via zero day in an abandoned plugin. And OpenBMC is caught with their pants down over a new security flaw. Jason Wood from Paladin Security joins us for expert commentary on abusing exchange via a new exploit technique, which is one API a call away from domain admin. All that and more on this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome everyone to Hack Naked News. This is episode 205 for January 29th, 2018. I'm of course your host, Paul Asadorian. Quick announcement, reminder to everyone that the RSA conference is coming up soon. It's the place to be for the latest in cybersecurity data innovation and thought leadership March 4th through the 8th in San Francisco. That's right, we'll be there conducting interviews, doing some briefings and uh, having fun. I'll be giving a presentation. You can visit rsaconference.com forward slash securityweekly dash US 19. Use the discount code 5U9SWFD to receive $100 even off of a conference pass. And now for the security news this week, researchers are releasing a tool, have released a tool that finds vulnerable robots on the internet. Written in Python 3, as Tarna is basically a port scanning tool with a built-in database of fingerprints for industrial routers from several different manufacturers and robotic technologies and components as well as patterns that power the tool to test those devices against various known vulnerabilities and security misconfigurations. You can download the source code at the link in the show notes at wiki.securityweekly.com. Again, this is episode 205, and it is an open source framework, so you can check it out. A new exploit is threatening over 9,000 hackable Cisco RV320 and RV325 routers worldwide. If the connectivity and security of your organization relies on the RV320 or 325 dual gigabit WAN VPN routers... Say that five times fast. It's awesome. Sounds spectacular. Uh, Except they're spectacularly vulnerable uh, because you need to immediately install the latest firmware update released by Cisco this week. Cyber attackers, that's right, not just regular attackers, cyber attackers have been actively exploiting two newly patched high severity router vulnerabilities in the wild after a security researcher released proof of concept exploit code on the internet last weekend. The vulnerabilities in question are a command injection flaw assigned to CVE 2019-1652 and an information disclosure flaw assigned to CVE 2019-1653, a combination of which could allow remote attacker to take full control of an affected Cisco router. Researchers from cybersecurity firm Bad Packets said they found at least 9,657 Cisco routers worldwide that are vulnerable to the information disclosure vulnerability. OpenBMC caught with, quote, pants down over a new security flaw. The pants down bug has been assigned CVE 2019-6260, has been nicknamed, of course, pants down, according to software engineer at the IBM Linux Technology Center, Stuart Smith, who published a technical write-up on the security issue. Smith says... The vulnerability lies in how the AS Speed, AST2400, and AST25 BMC implant advanced high-performance bus, or AHB, bridges 
which permit arbitrary read write access to the BMC's physical address space from the host or from the network if the BMC console UART is attached to a serial concentrator. Wow, that was a lot. Uh, in case you were wondering what the heck OpenBMC is, it's of course a project uh, by the Linux Foundation collaborative open source project whose goal is to produce open source information uh, implementation of the baseband management controllers firmware stack or BMC. WordPress sites are of course always under attack and now attackers have a new attack vector in an abandoned WordPress plugin. WordPress site owners are encouraged uh, to look for the total donations plugin if you're using that. And you're advised to delete that plugin from your server to prevent hackers from exploiting an unpatched vulnerability in the code and take over your site. Defiant, the company behind the WordPress WordFence firewall for WordPress, says that all attempts to contact the plugin's developer have been unfruitful. I love that we get to use the word unfruitful on the show. It's great. I don't remember a time we've used that in the past. Uh, the developer site appears to have gone inactive around May 2018, which, again, part of my fear of people producing code and abandoning it and it having security vulnerabilities. Now, you just have to delete it because there are no updates. Unless you want to take over this particular project for the brave souls that may want to embark on that endeavor. Uh, Microsoft Exchange is vulnerable to Priv Exchange, a zero-day exploit uh, for Microsoft Exchange 2013 and newer. They're vulnerable to this particular exploit that allows an attacker with just credentials of a single lowly exchange mailbox user to gain domain controller admin privileges with the help of, of course, a simple Python tool. According to the researcher, the zero-day isn't one single flaw, but a combination of three default settings and mechanisms that an attacker can abuse to escalate his or her access from a hacked email account to the domain admin um, uh, credentials or, or privileges. So we'll be talking more about that in the expert commentary coming up very soon. Did you know that yesterday was Data Privacy Day? If you missed it, you, you didn't really miss much. It was just like any other day, really. Like we went to work, we, we did shows and, and stuff, and I'm sure a lot of other people went to work and stuff. Uh, but anyway, uh, it really uh, was uh, without meaningful privacy except for those uh, offline and observed by the global surveillance um, Pana, Pana, Kapa, what is that? Say? I think there's a spelling mistake. Uh, some consortium, the nonprofit uh, National Cyber Cybersecurity Alliance, marked the occasion in 2007 with a gathering of corporate privacy policy wonks, according to the article, uh, from LinkedIn in San Francisco, California, at their headquarters. One must wonder if Facebook and Google were in attendance. Yes, I added that story just for that really lame joke, in case you were wondering. Apple turns off group FaceTime after discovering the eavesdropping bug. A newly discovered FaceTime bug poses an eavesdropping problem. Apple says it will have a fix out later this week. Uh, rumor has it there are already some uh, potential stopgap measures in place today. The bug does allow iPhone users to call another device via the FaceTime video chat, and I believe it's specific to group chat, serviced and hear the audio on the other end before the recipient has answered the call. That is, it can turn any iPhone into a hot mic without the user's knowledge. Uh, make sure you turn off FaceTime currently on all of your Apple devices. This includes iPhones, iPads, and your Apple Mac computers. So while I do run Android, I do have a Mac computer, and I had to go in and turn off Facebook. Uh, you can find instructions and a link how to do that in the show notes for this episode, and it does cover... Uh, both macOS and iOS-based devices as well. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with expert commentary on this exchange zero-day attack. Stay tuned. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. 
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, if you're making the conference circuit uh, this year, you're going to want to check out InfoSec World. So you go to RSA, then you go to InfoSec World. You can hang out with us at two conferences, April 1st through the 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort. will be the home for InfoSec World 2019. That's right. I will be giving presentations and lots of fabulous people who have been coming on the show, many of them, to talk about their talks and related topics. Make sure you use the registration code OS19-SECWEEK which gets you 15% off the main conference or a world pass. Jason Wood from Paladin Security is here with us to talk about abusing exchange. Welcome, Jason. Hey, Paul. Good to be with everybody, as always. Yes, it's so, nice to have you. Now, Jason, this is not a software vulnerability due to like a bug. It sounded to me like it was a series of configuration options, which I'm sure you're going to go into a lot of detail, but I wanted to ask you that before we get started. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we've got a combination of three default configuration options in Exchange that lead to this uh, scenario occurring. Mm -hmm. So it's not... Uh, you can be fully patched at this point, and yep. you're good to go, uh, or the attacker, rather, is good to go with this, this particular attack if we haven't changed the default settings. Um, so yeah, I, when I saw this story, I knew Paul was, was probably going to mention this in his news section, but I, I read through the, the, the write-ups on it and I thought maybe this would be a, something useful to dive into a little bit more because you, our listeners may find yourself being asked about whether or not the issue affects you and what could be done and maybe, you know, being stuck having to explain it. So I have in the show notes, the link to the original uh, blog post, which also includes a link to the uh, proof of concept code, which were released by a gentleman named, and I'm going to blow his name, uh, Durkan Molema um, on January 21st. So you got so the difficult to pronounce name. My name that I had in mind was Stuart Smith. I was like, that's awesome. I don't have to struggle to pronounce that. <laughs> you got the difficult one this week. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at him like, yeah, I'm host. Um <laughs> So, but he released that last week. This has started to get more traction as, as people are paying attention to it and testing it out in their environments. I also have a link to the SANS Internet Storm Center with their write-up and analysis of this, uh, which I thought was a pretty good write-up for how it affects us. Um, so as, as Paul and I just discussed, this, this actually is, is related to configuration settings. It applies to Exchange 2013, 16, and 19. Um, and like I said, you can be fully patched with everything and you're going to still be vulnerable. So here are the conditions that have to be that, that cause this. One, Exchange Server, as it is installed by default, has the right DACL permission or right DACL permission to the domain. Basically meaning it can exchange it can change the security privileges assigned to accounts or, or objects inside of the domain. So Exchange just has a lot of power in the domain by default. Two, when you install it, uh, and I'm not sure how this plays into domain settings through group policy or whatnot, but NTLM uh, authentication does not have signing enabled on Exchange, the newer versions of Exchange. Oddly enough, Exchange 2010 did have this enabled. And so... If you're running Exchange 2010, you're not vulnerable to this. Um, it's kind of an odd situation there. And finally, Exchange has some functionality built into it for push subscriptions. Uh, and that uh, gets sent over HTTP and sends the NTLM credentials to workstations or actually really any system that subscribes to a push notification uh, when it sends that down to us. So the, the push notifications, you know, are something actually I, I had to kind of glance at and kind of refresh myself on. That's the idea of here, if uh, I'm in Outlook, I want to be notified by the Exchange server immediately when something changes, like an email has arrived or somebody has changed something in a, uh, a folder or, or something like that. Uh, the Exchange server will send a notification to my client and let me know that Hey, this is this is there's something new here. You ought to go sync and, and pull down the information. Um, the that notification occurs over HTTP, 
but it includes the NTLM credentials because, well, we have to authenticate this is actually the Exchange server, right? Um, so with that, you probably are starting to see some potential issues here. And, and here's basically the flow of how this works. The attacker fires up their system. They do have credentials to just a regular old Exchange inbox, and they subscribe to an Exchange push notification. Once that notification gets triggered, like an email arriving, Exchange will send the notification down to the, the client, in this case, our Python script that uh, Dirk Young has uh, released. And they, um, we capture those credentials without the signing and then turn around and open up a connection over to the domain controller using LDAP and relay those NTLM credentials. Now, at that point, we have you know, the credentials of the Exchange server, which has the ability to change the permissions inside of Active Directory. So then we grant, let's say, our account privileges that we want it to have. Now, that could be as simple as saying, hey, make this domain admin, um, or we could perform other actions. Now, um, the researcher who put this out, he didn't enable that that bit of functionality. What he put in was the ability to dump password hashes from Active Directory instead. Obviously, though, you know, a, a generic user account can't do that. Uh, we have to borrow these credentials from Exchange. Um, and so that's where the, the, the credential sign, NTLM credential signing, comes into play here. Jason, it, it sounds uh, similar to um, impersonating a printer inside the domain and manipulating the resulting privileges and credentials. That was a technical segment on Paul Security Weekly, actually. Sounds yeah, somewhat and, similar. And it's, yeah, NTLM credential signing has been an issue that's been known for quite a while, mm. uh, right? And can come into play in numerous areas. The interesting thing about this to me is that the default configuration in Exchange 2010 had this turned on, and now it's gotten turned off somehow. Um, so yeah, we can just ride those credentials at that point because the privileges assigned to Exchange are so um, so broadly granted to it. Um, so what are some defenses that you can put in in the meantime while Microsoft comes out with their recommendations? Because at this point, we... I, I didn't see any. Uh, one, in, uh, enable NTLM signing. That should be, you know, the first and probably safest place to go to first, which will break this chain of events. You could also look at preventing Exchange from reaching back out to workstations and uh, sending out these push notifications on arbitrary ports, uh, which is the way that it's supposed to work. So if you're not using push notifications, you could turn that off or put in some kind of firewall to block it if you have that there. Uh, but that has the potential, obviously, for impacting some users and, and, and breaking some things. So your mileage may vary there. And another recommendation is to remove the high level of credit privileges that Exchange has to the domain. That one I start to get a lot more nervous about without a lot of testing because I don't know exactly what that's going to impact. And exchange is something that if something goes wrong, obviously it becomes visible to everybody right away. So do some heavy testing. I recommend you, you um, before you implement any of these things, uh, though the, like I said, the Intel M uh, signing should be something that you should have enabled already and, and shouldn't really cause too many issues at this point. I've got the links here in the show notes to uh, Dirk Allen's blog post. Also, the IS, SANS ISC write up on the issue. Uh, if you've got Exchange running your environment, which most of everybody does, you really ought to check this out and uh, evaluate how this impacts your environment and what you can do to, to protect yourself. Awesome. So there you are. Jason, thank you so much. That will conclude this episode of Hack Naked News. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. See you next time. <laughs>